Hi, I'm Isaac Stewart, art director here at Dragon Steel Entertainment, and I am here with... Hi, I'm Ben McSweeney. I'm one of the production artists with Dragon Steel Entertainment. So, and uh, for this book, uh, we got to work uh, fairly closely with Michael Whalen um, as he created the cover. We were basically here as uh, a support group in case he needed some help. Um, uh, fleshing things out or um, needing to know more about the canonical aspects of the world. So we were here as support and we uh, chatted with Michael a little bit about um, the cover concept and uh, we did, decided along with him that maybe providing some uh, concept art of Adolin's how he's dressed and how Shalon's dressed, maybe some of the plants, maybe some um, potential compositions would be um, helpful. So uh, I pitched this to Ben and Ben got to work. Yeah, well, I'll take any opportunity I can to work with Michael again. Uh, it helped a little bit that we had done this together for the, the Shalon end pages in, um, in words. Uh, so this was sort of like, let's let's go back and, and do a little bit of that again. Um, and in doing so, this uh, involved doing uh, a bit of compositional layout, just to sort of test, like, here's what I think it might could look like. Um, and we did a few of those. And I don't think I was the only person to, to throw these together. Um, I think you had done a couple as well. Yep, I, uh, I went through and did a bunch of uh, compositional layouts, different ideas. Yeah. Here's, I, I think there, the, I divided them into three different concepts, basically. Here's Shalon and Adolin traveling through Shadesmar. Here's Shalon and Adolin arriving at the fortress. Um, and here's Shalon and Adolin beholding this great spren in um, Shadesmar, which makes it sound, the great spren, I, it, that makes it sound more <laughs> magnificent. Well, no, no, it's a, it's a, iconic. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. We were all reading from the same uh, excerpt from the story. So we're all basically working from the same base point. Um, and uh, in, in doing so, we set up a few of these layouts and then we went with a few of these character designs. Um, so one of the first ones uh, that I had done uh, and I'm looking at this hopefully at the same time that you are, mm -hmm. uh, were the Adolin designs. Uh, and these were just a series of front-back illustrations of uh, uniform ideas. Um, trying to do just really rough thumbnail-type designs, because I don't want to dictate to Michael what should be done. Exactly. I'm just trying to provide him some ideas uh, and hoping that I can spark something with him that'll help him save time and just being able to contribute something that, that will help, you know, bring this forward. So you can see uh, from the designs that we had uh, some of the parts that Michael used uh, in the final, and you can see how he left some other parts behind. But I think we all agreed that uh, the same design that we all liked uh, with the, the chains around the belt and the side sword and uh, little bits of embroidery around the, 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 the hem jacket. Yeah. Uh, was where we ended up going with this. Uh, and I was really pleased with it. I was really happy that uh, he agreed. Yeah, and we, uh, we uh, showed, showed these to Brandon each week in Art Review, and Brandon gave his feedback, and uh, those were the ones that we ultimately sent to Michael. Now, we also did a series of uh, Shallan uh, costumes for the same purpose. Um, and in that one, I, I had fun, you know, just sort of taking the original Shalon design and revisiting that and then building off of that into new costume ideas that just sort of represented the the character that she was in in this excerpt, uh, which is more of a traveling garb. Um, she's definitely uh, hanging with royalty now, so she dresses well. Uh, she has, you know, all the equipment and, and the finer clothing that she needs. So uh, some of these ideas uh, were more uh, ostentatious. I think there's like a few that have sort of a, a collar or look more of a traveling sort of jacket and then some that look more practical with the satchel that's always there to carry her sketchbook and her, her gear. Um, and in this one, I think Michael definitely did more of his own thing for the final. Uh, I feel like he, he actually revisited sort of what we did with, um, with the end pages 
uh, in terms of her outfit. Uh, but there are, yeah, yeah there are. There, some you can see the influence of all of these things coming together. Yeah, um, I think Figure One is the one that we sent over, and he he did pull a lot of inspiration. I think from it, if you look at the um, designs on the hem of the uh, traveling dress, and kind of how the 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 dress itself goes up to um, its calf length. Um, I think he took those design cues and incorporated it into the uh, into the cover as well, the final cover. Well, I think that was the one that also was the closest to the, what we had done before. So yeah. it was taking those cues and running forward with them further. Um, beyond that, uh, I know we have, uh, let's see, the next thing on here, just going by order, are a few plant ideas. These were so, These were definitely not super strong ideas. I, I was much more pleased with what Michael ended up doing. So I don't know that these helped at all. Uh, and we might even just skip this part. Yeah, um, these we, we got to this part and Michael said, I have everything I need. And yeah. so and, and that's what he ended up doing great. Was, yeah, and yeah, what he ended up doing was way better. So, uh, and then there was this aspect of the design that Michael didn't end up using at all. Um, because ultimately we had a few different scenes to go with. And the one that I had drawn a composition for was slightly different than the one that he ended up going with for the final cover. So this creature design never got used, uh, never got seen. And because it's such an iconic moment in the book, it kind of has remained under wraps. There's no good other place to show it to people without it being a huge spoiler. But uh, we were, it's such a cool design that we decided that we need to use it somewhere. So when Tor approached us saying, hey, we'd like to create a, um, what amounted to a laptop sticker, um, Ben came up with some different concepts that ultimately we decided not to use. And then we said, hey, let's go back to that. Let's go back to that, uh, that creature design that you did. And so uh, you started uh, making some sketches. We showed them to Brandon. Uh, we, we ultimately came up with this really cool constellation-y looking critter um, that I think everybody's gonna love. It's a, it's a beautiful sticker. Thank you. Well, with so many of these designs, the, the mandates are coming from Brandon. Uh, you know, it's, it's his descriptions that determine that it has these aspects of the stars and aspects of uh, dragons and dragonflies and insectile shapes and carapace and, you know, all of this stuff I take from him and then derive into an illustration. Uh, but, you know, it starts off with Brandon. Um, I was really pleased with this because, yeah, it came out. It was also one of these things where we were playing around with sinuous sh shapes uh, at the same time we were doing this, we were trying to come up with something that was working with his signature, um, which we ultimately had something different come together, but all of these things were happening at the same time. And so in trying to express that, uh, I ended up doing this very nice, yeah, lowering S shape uh, that was able to uh, adapt well for, for this picture. And yeah, I think uh, Tor wants to use it as a, a sticker design or a decal, uh, I'm not sure what, but hopefully we're gonna be able to use it on a lot of things because I think it came out pretty pretty, pretty cool. So this is um, everybody who pre-ordered a book from one of the bookstores that are part of the event tonight um, gets this sticker in with their book along with uh, an epic bookmark. I think this book has more of your art in it than any of the previous books. I think I beat myself by one. Uh, yeah, we got one extra from all the previous. So every book I've gotten at least a couple extra pieces. Yeah. And this time we've got a grand total of 10. So uh, 10 plus a reprint of a previous one. 10 plus a reprint of a previous one plus icons. Plus new icons, yep. So anyway, Ben was a lifesaver on this book to be able to uh, jump on board and take care of a, a lot of things that in some cases fall, uh, used to fall on my shoulders, things like the icons and stuff, which um, more and more, you're doing more of that, um, which I actually really appreciate because I love your 
inking style and think it turns out really nicely. Uh, so uh, first off, dive into this, how did you get involved with uh, Brandon and Dragonsteel Entertainment? Uh, so I, I first uh, ran into Brandon. Uh, well, uh, first I I heard him on a podcast. I was listening to a Dragon Page cover to cover. It was the old Michael Stackpole and Michael Menengay joint. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got to listen to Brandon do the elevator pitch for um, Mistborn. And I really, really liked what I heard. And so I went out and I read the book. I, I have been an avid consumer of uh, fantasy and, and science fiction and genre fiction in general uh, for my entire life. So, um, and at the time I was working as an animator uh, and an illustrator and I read the first novel and I was just was blown away. Uh, Brandon writes very interesting cool concepts, things that sort of drove me to want to create a few illustrations and some designs. And in doing so, I created a few pieces of fan art, uh, some illustration and design pieces, and I uploaded them to the fan forums at the Time Wasters Guide back then. And because the way the, uh, the internet works and Brandon was active in his own social media, uh, he saw the work I had done and he contacted me and asked if I would be interested in helping him develop uh, a few pieces for this new epic series that he was going to pitch to Tor, which turned out to be the Stormlight Archives. And that would be in about 2008, 2009. So, And you were already working professionally as an artist at that time. No, I had been, a, I had been an illustrator uh, for, uh, since about 1995, uh, working in kids' magazines and then in role-playing games and in comics. And then I had been an animator since about 2000, uh, working mostly in the boutique industry, which is to say doing a lot of short films, music videos, uh, television commercials. Um, at that time, I think the, the most well-known thing I had done was the Red vs. Blue animated shorts, which were still not super well-known at that time. Um, and I had done uh, their first 2D piece back in 2008. Uh, and then, yeah. Uh, Brandon was uh, my first opportunity to work with uh, a print uh, prose author working uh, in uh, on a novel and adapting that. And it turned out to be something that I have a real passion for, which is just adaptation in general and the study of like why we adapt certain things and how we adapt books and comics and things into animated films and live action films. So getting a chance to start right at the beginning at it, adapting uh, Stormlight visually and bringing this strong visual element that he was driving because Brandon always from the start had this idea that he wanted to have a lot of illustrations in the book and that he wanted to drive this diegetic illustration concept of in-world illustrations coming from in-world artists and all of that just really appealed to me. So, so um, you, you mentioned that up to that point, red versus blue was maybe the most recognizable thing that you had um, done. Since that time, you've, you've gotten to work on several high profile things as well. Uh, can you talk about any of those or just list off some of the things you've been able to work on? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, my, my, I've had a, a really interestingly varied career in animation and, uh, and in production. Um, in 2011, 2012, I was the cinematics director for Darksiders 2, which was a, a really amazing experience that I was highly underqualified for, but uh, I got thrown into the deep end and just swam with it. Um, from there, I got to work in, uh, I went from working in boutique animation into television animation. Um, and I worked first on a series called The Awesomes uh, as an animator. Then I got to work as a storyboard artist on Archer. Um, got to do a few Aqua Teen Hunger First commercials. Uh, ultimately moved to Canada and worked on Rick and Morty, which is probably now one of the most famous things that I've gotten to work on. Uh, I was a lead animator for season three. Uh, and then I was a storyboard artist on The Dragon Prince, which was a lot of fun. And uh, yeah. Honestly, I, I sometimes feel like Stormlight might be one of the things that I'm more well known for now because there I'm allowed to actually be credited and I get acknowledged <laughs> directly. Right. 
Well, uh, let's uh, let's dive in a little bit here. First, I'm, I think I'm going to jump to the icons, and then we'll go back to this to the uh, spren. So, because uh, that kind of seems to be a, a good jumping off point. When I uh, when I put together the art for a Stormlight book, the first thing I do is I go to Brandon, and I say, Brandon, what ideas do you already have? Um, which new character viewpoints are you going to put into this book? And I kind of get a general idea of what he's planning. And then when I finally get to read the book, I meld those two things together. I meld what I have found in the book, what Brandon has talked to me about the book, and I start putting together a list of things that needs to go into the book. And one of those things is the, the new viewpoint icons that uh, we are going to do. Um, and then in, in this book, well, we, we add a few more. Um, First off, Risen gets her first icon for the first time. She's had viewpoints in the previous books, and, and now uh, she gets an icon. So let's uh, talk a little bit about the uh, Risen's icon. Oh, yeah, this one was fun. Um, I should mention so, first off that when I pitched this to you, Ben, that we knew that we were probably going to have two different versions of this, um, possibly, because we talked about Dawn Shard, um, the novella, it was going to use uh, Risen's icon in some form on the cover. And so going into this, we knew that it might have a dual purpose. Right. And that talks to the graphic design aspects of what we do beyond just illustration. Um, one of the things we knew was that we were probably going to have it featuring Chiri Chiri, uh, which meant we were going to have to explore uh, the actual anatomy and details of a Larkin uh, more than we had done up to that point. Um, and I think I think we nailed into doing Cheery Cheery as the icon focus pretty pretty much from the start, right? Or was it was, we're going to do a Larkin? I think we knew from the beginning that Risen's icon was going to be Cheery Cheery. Cheery Cheery. Right. And so then we we gathered everything that we had uh, internally, uh, which I think mostly was the designs that uh, are are forming the the background of the the gem map. Uh, from early on in the series, which was one of your designs. Yep. And then we took a look at uh, at everything that we could find online, because I think it's always worth acknowledging that we do see fan art, and we look at it, and we go, you know, are the fans seeing the same things that we are seeing? Um, and then I sort of did the thing I like to do, which is that I started to explore the sort of abstract designs in a more detailed fashion, um, just trying to pick out the anatomy uh, in a way that I could uh, explain and express uh, from any angle, trying to make sure I understood the character. Um, and to that end, we have a few of these uh, anatomy studies, which are very sketchy, but they don't have to be super detailed. They just sort of have to work out where we're going with this. And then we also started to work out what we were going to do for the actual icon. Um, all of the icons for Stormlight are in this circle template. So right there, that sort of establishes uh, some compositional basis because we know we're going to have to work with that circle. Um, and yeah, we did one that was basically uh, a simple silhouette or a semi-silhouette and one that was um, more illustrated with a, a sort of detailed hatching style. Uh, the detailed one becomes the icon that appears in Dawn Shard and appears in, uh, I believe it appears in Rhythm uh, at, at some point. Yeah, the, both of the uh, hatched versions, um, they, they appear as Risen's uh, chapter icon in both, uh, yeah. both, both Rhythm of War and Dawn Shard. And then the semi-silhouette version, we ended up using... Uh, as a badge icon, uh, both for a sort of embossed logo to go on the cover, and then also as a smaller uh, stamp logo that appears on the spine. Um, and yeah, that just... One of the things that I, I find advantageous to the weirdly eclectic background I have coming from magazines and cartooning and television commercials, all this other stuff, is being able to apply uh, a wide range of design skills uh, to the projects that we have so that I can do both illustration and anatomy studies and then also come in and do 
basic graphic design functions yeah. where we're functioning on simple shape and, and readability at a small size. So, um, and it's a lot of fun to be able to stretch out that way and do all these things at once. Let's move on to uh, Teravangian's icon. So we've, we've had viewpoints from Teravangian um, in the books before. Um, he continues to have viewpoint chapters. And so it, it felt like it was time for him to also get his own icon. Uh, that to Ben. And uh, Ben, you had this sort of, uh, you, you immediately were drawn to the, the idea that the kind of the dichotomy that um, Teravangian experiences, uh, you know, one day he can be one thing and the next day he can um, be another. So, um, you know, smart versus emotional, I think is what we were calling it. Um, so yeah, talk, talk a little bit about uh, kind of your, your process there. So this one was fun because yeah, I think really early I pegged into the idea that I wanted to do. I, I'm not sure whose idea it was that we should do something in this sort of uh, illustrative style uh, that we ended up going with. Um, I'm not sure what to even refer to it as, almost a playing card style. But Yeah, it looks very uh, playing The idea card. that we were going to focus on this yin-yang aspect, this uh, mirrored image uh, part, and we brought that into the composition uh, intentionally creating something that would lock together two versions of Teravangian, uh, one that represents the cold and clinical and uh, side of him, and one that represents the emotional and, and, and feeling side of him. And then I think my pitch was that if, uh, if possible, uh, in any given chapter, uh, whether Teravangian is experiencing his smart self or his simple self, uh, we would rotate the icon. And I don't know if that managed to make it all the way into the book, but I sure hope it did. It, it, sure, like it, it, it should have. That's how I submitted it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a nice idea that, yeah, if you look closely at the icon for Teravangian, you get a little clue as to where he is in his, uh, in his state at that time. So uh, one of the things I remember when we were showing this to Brandon was... Um, we were drawn to more of the, the full body shot, but it was a little too stylized at first. It was hard to read. Um, it was cool, kind of in this Escher sort of way. Um, so that was, yeah. one, that was one bit of feedback that we gave on this. And the other bit of feedback was uh, that his clothing was looking, he was looking a little too European, a little too much like a playing card in that regard. And so we said, let's, uh, let's focus on um, Asian designs a little bit more kind of pushing because that that's kind of where we go with the designs of the uh, the Vedans and the the Alethi and that is a, a little more toward a, an Eastern sort of feel. Well, and certainly in the early designs, we also didn't really have a strong idea of what Teravangian should look like insofar as these depictions are representative at all. Uh, you know, there weren't any, any canonized depictions of the character. Um, and we were able to go in and check out some of the more popular uh, depictions that were happening at the time, uh, especially stuff that had happened in Call to Adventure, which has been uh, just wonderful for... Uh, depicting so much of the Stormlight Archives in such a, a delightfully fa uh, excellent fashion. And so um, we had to sort of go around a bit about what Teravangian looked like. And I think uh, some of the earlier designs, he was a little stockier. And then in some of the designs, it was a question of whether he wore a crown and what kind of crown would that be? Um,
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think we just played into that that conception of him and um, showed it to Brandon. Brandon liked it, proved it. So I don't know how canon icons are. Yeah, there we go. So uh, let's talk a little bit about kind of what you did for the bulk of the, the book. Um, the bulk of this was, as, as you know, you've seen the cover. Shalon and Adolin are traveling in Shadesmar. Um, Shalon, being the kind of the naturalist that she is, is cataloging the types of um, high spren that she sees. Hi, is high spren, maybe not high spren, but the uh, radiant, spren? radiant spren, thank you. Uh, cataloging the types of radiant spren that she sees. And so we have um, nine of these in the book, and we're going to talk about a few of them here. Why don't we start with cultivation spren? Because that was the first one that I think we um, got you going on. Yep. Nope. And that's the one where I have uh, the most. We're only going to talk about a handful here, I think, uh, partly for time and partly because uh, spoilers. And partly because I feel like uh, the places where I, we go wrong are more interesting than when things go right. And with a lot of these designs, we were able to slot in pretty pretty quickly. Uh, there was not a lot of, of uh, mistakes or, or, you know, strange paths taken. And so this ended up being one of the more straightforward uh, series of productions. But with a few of these, we did have some interesting exploration. Uh, and in the first of this was the cultivation spread. Um, I think if we were starting at the very beginning, there are a few uh, pieces that I had done uh, actually in a, a hand-drawn, literally working. Most of the time I work digitally. I'm working in Photoshop quite a lot. Um, but for a few things, uh, especially in, uh, in, in, Oath, uh, in Oathbringer, I had actually started to work in physical media. Uh, because digital just wasn't providing me with the literal hands-on experience I needed to create certain pieces of artwork. Um, so I still was sketching in sketchbooks uh, when I started working on this, and I did a few uh, early explorations of the cultivation spread. But these, I think, were a little too just generically plant people. Um, there's a lot of like use of leaves for the cheeks, or blossoms for the lips, and um, in, a, in a, a very real sense, this is not where we wanted to go, but it helps to get that design idea out of your head, uh, and just put it down and say, look, uh, like this, but not like this, and then that moves on. Um, the next one I started to do was when I actually started working uh, on, some, on some paintings, um, and the first of those would be, I think, uh, the one that's listed as number one, uh, in, in the list there, it's just this sort of, uh, bald androgynous figure with the swirling vines that are making up the face. Um, the thing about this one is that the vines are too thick. Uh, it's too obvious, too evident that the character is being made up of, of these, um, the thing here, we, uh, Brandon and I came back with the feedback that the, the vines were a little too thick and we were thinking. You know, maybe, maybe um, from far away, you wouldn't be able to necessarily tell that they were made up of vines until you get fairly close up. And then you would see things kind of like the sinews of muscles almost. Yeah, and we ended up, I ended up going in basically just refining various faces until I was getting finer and finer work in the cheeks and then allowing it to sort of thicken as it runs to the sides. Um and I think we came up with something that uh, everybody is pretty pretty pleased with. Uh, I know that I ended up using one of these early concept faces in the final, uh, yeah. modifying it some and adding hair and crystals, but uh, still having the same basic cheeks and eye structure. One of the things yeah. that we tried here that we ultimately uh, failed at and did not include in the book were attempts to do the dead eye spren, which was really tricky. I... I and I still find this, like, well, we failed at it. Um, and some of the examples that you're seeing now uh, are where we try to go with it. But the way Brandon describes it and the way he continued to describe it is something that I'm not sure is easy to capture visually. It's very much sort of that thing from The NeverEnding Story where it's nothing 
uh, and in the place of their eyes is nothing, and a hole would be something, and this is nothing. Uh, you know, scratched out space would be something, but this should be nothing, and we tried a few things, it didn't work. He, I think he has described it as looking like it has been they, they turn one way like this, that would be almost like a plane of erasure that is floating around with them. And if were this animated, we might have been able to come up with something that would match it in some way. But in one picture, yeah. in one we picture... We a few it's, weeks trying to find it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it, it, it was. Uh, it's a, it's still kind of this concept that it's sort of hard to uh, hard to draw. Yeah, I like what I ended up doing with some of the the scratched out effects, uh, just because it has this sort of dry uh, grass, looks like old hay or straw, uh, and it's very creepy. Uh, it's creepy, but it is not accurate to what he's attempting to describe. So we ultimately ended up not using it. Um, we do move on uh, from doing these sort of loose concepts to doing a page layout. And we try to get to that as early as possible uh, because ultimately this is what I'm going to deliver for the book, which is a, a finished layout illustration. Um, and a lot of what, like I said, a lot of what we did from the beginning here, maybe it's because this is our fourth go around, um, maybe it's just because uh, a lot of these concepts were very much open to interpretation, but we didn't have to do a lot of uh, back and forth on, on layout or, or content for these pages, I don't think. Um, so we started off with rough sketches. We start importing uh, aspects into it. That's where I decided to try and use that rough face as a basis building more character illustration uh, and, and these illustrations just build up phase by phase, uh, continuously checking with you guys, getting feedback from Brandon as to whether or not it's working. And asking questions too. Sometimes, like on these, you're asking questions like, what What do the eyes look like? What do the hands yeah. look like? Do, do we they have, have crystal uh, teeth? Uh, yeah, what do the teeth look like? And that um, that on these particular early. drawings, the, the one, the uh, uh, spren drawings, radiant spren drawings, uh, we had a lot of feedback from Karen, who went through continuity-wise and, and tried to find information for us uh, that to make sure that we weren't going against continuity or anything like that. And, and, and her notes were very helpful. Oh, yeah. No, I had an extensive little booklet of uh, every example of where Brandon had actually mentioned anything about a spren specifically in the text of the books up to that point. And like I said, that's the that's always the joy and the trick of working on on Brandon's stuff is has he been specific? And if he hasn't, where we have room to play around. Um, One of the reasons we started with the uh, cultivation spread, because you started on this before Brandon um, had started the writing of the book uh, on this particular one. Uh, we started with this one because this uh, the cultivation spread were some that we had seen the most of. We had some concrete ideas of, of what they would look like. I believe they showed up in Oathbringer. Um, we've yeah. also got, yeah. we've also have Wendell, who is Lyft Spren, um, showing up. So the, um, we started with this one because as Brandon was writing the book, he, he had more, he would flesh out more of what he knows about some of these different Spren. And in other cases, uh, we kind of had to, pick his brain um, about the spren to find out more details because maybe it's not mentioned as much in the book what they're like. Um, maybe that's a good time to, for us to jump into something like the, uh, the ash spren because that's one that we just, we don't see a lot of and one that we, you kind of had to develop based on a, a few key details. Well, and it was one where, uh, again, I went with some of the things he had written, and it's only when he sees the visual that he can say, no, no, this is too much, or you've gone too far. Uh, some of these things, he literally, we're not thinking about them until they come up visually, like, do the cultivation spren also have crystal teeth? Um, and in this case, the ash spren, we knew that they had this effect that he had written about, uh, where they're their skin, their muscle, their bone, everything up to the bone 
uh, will flick away into ash when they move or when they gesture or when they speak. Um, and it'll expose for a moment, you know, the skeletal fingertips or a little bit of, uh, you know, extra jaw, uh, or skull, but the degree to which it was being done wasn't really clear. I had done an initial design, uh, that was really, really playing it up. Like the idea that, you know, this character, with the, if there's a breeze, just half the hand blows away and leaves uh, a skeleton bony hand. Um, and that was going too far. So this was an opportunity for Brandon to say, like, you know, no, the, this is this is too much. Uh, it should be more subtle. Uh, and it's that, you know, they they if they snap their finger, you might see a glimpse of bone, but it would immediately reform into hand. And there would be ash and and smoke that would f drift away. But it's not it's not too much of a horror show all the time. Uh, I know I have a sketch here of someone with like half the face that's sort of just missing and seeing the skull inside, and that's too much. So uh, we ended up moving on to uh, into the layout, knowing that uh, I needed to be more subtle about it, and that's reflected in the illustrations that we ultimately went with, which is uh, basically a trio of, of character uh, illustrations. There's two standing figures, a male and a female. Well, there's a standing female and a seated male, and then a, a character sort of bust. Um, and we, we brought back, you know, the, the idea of the skeleton stuff. We wiped that way down. Um, and you kind of reset a lot of other things, too. Just, I'm sorry? Um, we also kind of did a soft reset on this one, too, because the, uh, the attitude really wasn't showing through. And that gave Brandon an opportunity to say, these, these guys are a little more, I hate to say the word, you know, punk-like, but they're, they're, they have more attitude. They're, they're, they have more attitude. When they see them in um, Shadesmar, they're the ones who are kind of going to give you the stink eye and then intentionally let a piece of themselves blow away just to kind of unnerve you. Um, yeah. And that shows through now in kind of the design of the clothing that you do because it's quite a bit of a departure from that early sketch. Well, in general, this was a good one to try and break me out of a, a rut that I hadn't even realized I was getting in, which is that I was just, and I, I think honestly with the set, they tend to be of a set, which is that we have a couple of standing figures that represent various radiant spren. Um, but in this one, uh, I, I went back, I looked at some, some models, I looked at some photo reference, I looked at people, uh, and I actually tried to create an illustration that looked like one of Shallan's moments. Uh, it's not possibly as photorealistic as her preternatural drawing ability, ability would represent, but uh, it, it was meant to be less static and less clinical than some of the other drawings. And yeah, this was an opportunity, I think, to try and sneak in a little bit of that with uh, with the character. Just, you know, it's a rude gesture that the, the Ash Spren will give, which is to just sort of flick away their lip and it blows away, and it gives a little snarl, and then it all grows back. So, and this is actually one of my favorite pieces of the Spren pieces now. I, I, I think it's really unique and cool. Um, of course, we want to know more about these, and uh, I love how you drew the, the Spren. Each one of these has what the Spren look like in Shadesmar and how they appear in... Um, uh, just on Roshar in the uh, the physical realm. And uh, this one was described to us as those uh, when they electrocute wood and they grow these, um, I don't know, what you, tendrils of fire going through wood. You can look it up on YouTube and see it. But we, that was described to us like that, of, of these things, fire growing through the air, kind of branching and splitting, burning. Yeah, we didn't get that. We didn't get that right until nearly the very end when uh, Brandon really laid it down as like, no, look at like wood burning effects. And I went and I actually did look at video and reference and saw that I had been getting it completely because we had had the description of them looking like cracks and like burning cracks in the wood uh, or in the surface of whatever they were appearing in. But we weren't getting that lightning effect and that branching effect which uh, ultimately really fits well with the lore anyhow because it creates sort of a fractal pattern and it has that nice mirroring of a natural form. So luckily that's something we managed to get right 
right at the end. So Turned out really nice. The last one we have, if we want to grab one more here, is the Honor Spren, which the Honor Spren, yeah, I think is nice, uh, both because there was a couple of, uh, of of stumbles at the beginning with it, but also because the Honor Spren are both uh, very well known to us, sort of. And at the same time, not really well known to us at all in the way they appear in Shadesmar. And we're going to spend a lot of time with them. So uh, in this piece, this one I felt really important that I had to get it right. I, 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 I struggled with this one. It was one that we started early and finished last. And I'm still not sure if I really got it, but I tried real hard. Um, uh, it turned out great. It, 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 it came out better than, than I feared. <laughs> um, certainly I had started off early on uh, just sort of depicting these sort of noble characters. And I had uh, this reference of a woman sort of holding out a, a dress that I tried to base this illustration off of. Um, but I feel like in the early sketches, it's just, it's definitely not working. Uh, I'm not feeling it correctly. And it wasn't until I actually got to read the early draft of the book um, which wasn't until, gosh, uh, early this year, um, that I, I was able to re-see these characters and really envision them properly. One of the trickiest parts about this whole project was that, yeah, I had to sort of design the Radiant Spren before Brandon had really written about the Radiant Spren. And that made it, it was like, it was an opportunity to sort of, uh, inspire him and create, uh, new, I ideas at the same time it's very it's very difficult considering that the normal job is to sort of represent what he's written um but certain aspects of them became much clearer after i was able to read the chapters uh that they carry real steel swords while everything else about them is manufactured out of uh stormlight and their their essence but they carry real weapons and that really stood out to me so i knew i needed to get that in there um Reading about some of the other characters, just seeing other descriptions that Brandon had written. Uh, I got a Takama in there, which I had somehow managed to miss through a couple of books as being a, a distinct piece of clothing. Uh, and now I, I try and get it in wherever I can. Uh, the Takama being these these skirts that are, are very common to the Vedans and the, the Alethi. Um, we found an opportunity towards the end here with the male character to slip in just a, a hint of that design of that spren that we designed for that other thing that wasn't oh, yeah. getting used. It's right there at the bottom of his coat. Did you never Yeah, notice? how did I not I'm notice that? Because I'm cool. Speaking. It's I just in there saw with that. the pearls and the gems that yeah. are making up his outfit. Uh, is just yep, a hint. I see it. Cool. Um, another thing that you added here at the uh, end was um, influenced by Michael's cover. And that was when he painted Lasting Integrity on the back of the Rhythm of War illustration. Um, we used, you used his um, as reference to also put it on your page here. Yeah, I managed to, once I realized that he was going to go ahead and do it as well, uh, I, I saw that opportunity to sneak in just a little bit of the scenery uh, and, and put uh, just another opp opportunity uh, of, for that exterior of the building. Lasting Integrity's exterior is the least interesting thing about that location. And I'm just sorry we couldn't do an illustration of the interior of it. But it's just too much. Yeah, it's too cool. I think it would be it's too spoiler. a bit mind-bending, too. It's pretty cool. Now that the book is out, uh, I, I look forward to seeing a lot more uh, fan art and uh, doing some more illustrations of my own uh that we can use to to display all these really cool aspects of the new books that have never been seen and couldn't be shared until now one of the things that i like that you added to this was about halfway through the honor spren we had the uh, how they appear in the physical plane as sort of the wind spren right and i like that you added a sort of a sill type character so that to show that they also can appear you know, in a humanoid form as well. Um, I yeah, like I think I tried at one point to sneak in another critter or something, and it was it was too much. It was too many things. So doing one that was the sort of whipping little points of light that are the windspren, 
and then showing how they also uh, appear as full figures. So all of these were a lot of fun uh, to do, even if they were super challenging uh, from a, a wide range of aspects. Brandon is always pushing me out of my comfort zone and forcing me to, to try and be a better illustrator, to do things that I've never done before, which I appreciate even as I kick and scream about it. No, I, I'm right there with you. I'm, I'm, I'm constantly uh, pushed as well by um, some idea that he'll come up with that he can describe in the book, and it sounds really awesome, but has anybody ever drawn that before, right? Yeah, I have no idea how to draw that. Ah, oh, now i got to learn how to do that. Yeah, I mean, it, as some sort of ethereal concept that you're reading about, you can kind of just sort of imagine it and move on. Um, but then when you sit down and you start drawing it, you go, wait, how does some of, how does this work? Parts fit together. Yeah, and they do. Yeah. It's just you got to find the way to, to make it fit. It has been one of the more enjoyable aspects about adapting some of his material into visual design. Uh, I, I get a lot of fun out of doing the flora and the fauna, especially the, the animals. Um, coming up with designs like the chasm fiend or the axe hound. Uh, is just it's really rewarding to sort of try and figure out ways to make these puzzle pieces fit together um, so that it both meets the description that he has written, uh, but also uh, tries to bring in ideas of your own uh, and something that's just ultimately the coolest concept possible for the the scene. Um, so much of, of what we do uh is is ideal for adaptation. It's one of the things that I think makes Brandon a strong author. Uh, is is that he he's he's got a really neat. He really runs that line, man. Of like he doesn't over describe, but yet the few tidbits he gives you and the way he writes his scenes makes you want to see what you're reading and makes as an artist makes me want to draw what I'm what I'm imagining, um, and yet. It, when you actually try to get details out of the text, it's so very little that he actually writes down as hard fact, uh, as written word. There's so much room to interpret and to play around. And it is interesting that you, you look at it that way. I think it's a great it's a great skill to be able to give just a few details, right? He's not doing these huge long paragraphs of description, giving you every minutia of detail, right? Yet you look at a lot of fan art, obviously can be influenced with each other, right? There's a lot of cross-pollination going on there, but by and large, you can do a picture of a character or, or th something, and just from those few words of description, yeah. people are coming up with things that look very similar. Uh, you can tell what it is. and It's uh, amazing how often we agree. Yeah, and, and I, I think that that's uh, quite the skill that he has as a writer that he can um, share this world in such a way that we're experiencing it more or less in very similar ways. Uh, I certainly think it's one of the things that makes him a really fun author to work for. Uh, it, he, he gives you a lot of room to play. Uh, honestly, the job would be easier if he was more descriptive, if he would write more details. But at the same time, I think he's clearly got the balance down because, as you say, you go and you look at the various representations of various characters and scenes and events, and there is a lot more consensus than there is disagreement. Yeah. So I think that's a good place for us to end right there. I think we have wrapped this up as far as we can take it. Uh, thanks so much, guys. I appreciate it. Uh, this is just the best job. I love what I'm doing. <laughs> I, I agree. And it's good to have you um, along for the ride. I've been missing the, the um, studio aspect that I used to have at my other jobs. And this sort of helps fulfill um, that, you know, having actual art co artist co-workers. <laughs> yeah, to the very small degree that we can do that. But then considering that everybody has to work online these days, I guess the fact that we're hundreds and hundreds of miles apart is not that much different than if we were, you know, in the same city, but still having to work separately. So, yeah. 